So, um, welcome everybody. Um, you've probably already read uh, his brief bio. He doesn't want me to go into the other one that shares much more of his history. Humble man. <laughs> um, but Father Fred is a member of the Central and Southern Province of Jesuits. He's a Catholic priest, a retreat director, an author, advocate, and an attorney. He's the director of the Jesuit Social Research Institute a post he has held since 2009. Previously, Father Fred was president of Catholic Charities USA from 1992 to 2001, that nation's largest voluntary human service network. Father Fred has also been a policy advisor for health and welfare issues, Department of Social Development and World Peace, US Catholic Conference, and from 1984 to 1989, he was Executive Director of Catholic Community Services of Baton Rouge. Father Fred, it's an absolute privilege having you here this afternoon. Welcome. Thank you, Carol. That's actually out of date. I'm the ex-director of the Jesuit <laughs> Social Research Institute after 12 years, and th having this wonderful sabbatical year, first half of which I was able to write, update my book on Catholic social teaching, and then I wrote some people around the world and said, do you have anything I could do? And Frank Brennan said, come to Australia. So I've been here since the 10th of March, a little delay due to, to uh, immigration requ uh, requirements, etc. but I'm happy, delighted to be here with you all. I want to start with a quote from Bishop Vincent Van Long, Vincent Long Van Nguyen, who's now the Bishop of Parramatta, and who's a refugee from Vietnam himself. He wrote this on behalf of the Aust Australian bishops about welcoming immigrants. He wrote, Australia rose to the challenge in the past with its generous embrace of migrants and refugees. It proved itself especially courageous during the Indo-Chinese exodus and accepted an unprecedented number of Asian refugees. He doesn't say including himself. Australia has changed for the better, as it always has with, with, with each successive wave of new arrivals. Australia is what it is today because of their determination and drive for a better future. We honor the legacy of this great nation not by excessive protectionism, isolation and defense of our privilege at all costs. Rather, we make it greater by our concern and care for asylum seekers in the spirit of compassion and solidarity that has marked the history of our country from its beginning. So I thought that was a wonderful quote and it sets the right tone for what I'd like to do today. So what, I'm, what am I trying to do? A Couple of different things. I wanna provide a preliminary kind of environmental scan on migration in the world and give you sort of some updated figures. Second, I want to situate the plight of immigrants today in the context of major events and figures in salvation history. And I want to reflect on key scriptural themes which challenge us to respond to the suffering of people on the move. And lastly, then, how the principles of modern Catholic social thought can shape our judgments and our actions on Catholics and as leaders in ministry. Um, just the environmental scan. Before I get into the meat of the topic, it's good to do this, and, and more church documents since Vatican II will start with the environmental scan, the facts in the world today, um, and then get into theologizing and, 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 and reflecting on those realities. There are 7.9 billion people in the world today, and that's as of 2022, that's the UN estimate. There are 196 sovereign states in the world, according to the United Nations. Now, there's an additional five to 10 states that are in the process of becoming. They're sometimes called the uh, Olympic nations. There were 206 Olympic nations at the last Olympics. There are 281 million international migrants in the year 2020 worldwide. Now, that's up from 154 million in 1990. Now, what do they mean by an international migrant? Someone who is living in the country they were not born in. Now, that could be someone who went to graduate school in Paris and liked to stay in Paris. Uh, so it's not necessarily what we would call immigrants, refugees in the sense that we call it that. But this is, we're going to kind of look at a couple of different sets of facts with different names for them. That's international migrants. Um, and this is also an increase of 60 million people since 2010. 63% of these people come from middle-income populations in their home cities. So that might be more like the person who went to graduate studies somewhere and decided to stay. 
And this does not include internal migrants, people who have been moved out of their home, as in my country. A lot of people in New Orleans after the Hurricane Katrina were called on the news uh, refugees, and they, were, they got very offended by it. And, and I said to somebody, well, they're not technically refugees because they didn't leave the country. Uh, but they were what's called internally displaced people, and I'll get to those statistics in a minute. There are 84 million people who are considered to be forcibly displaced under the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees mandate, and that's up from 82.4 million people at the end of 2020. That's an increase of 1.6 million. Now, these are individuals for forcibly moved as a result of persecution, conflict, generalized violence, or human rights violations. 42% of these people were under the age of 18. Some 26.6 million are refugees, meaning that they have crossed an international border. And more than half of those are children. More than half of this number are from Syria. 6.7 million are from Syria. And, and other high-ranking countries are Afghanistan and South Sudan. This is the highest level of refugees ever recorded. And the new refugees now from Ukraine, we're hearing numbers like 4 million, they're not in these numbers. Um, so we're going to see another spike in the, in the numbers, et cetera. Uh, the global figure included 50.9 million internally displaced people. Now, that's the people who've been moved, let's say, who've stayed within Ukraine but have been moved out of their, the east to the west, et cetera. And, but they're still within their national boundaries. Now, what about Australia? Now, these are the figures from the 2016 uh, census in Australia. So the, and the, these are the figures. There are 26 million people who live in Australia. 6.1 million of them are immigrants. That's 23% of the population. Now, let's look at the numbers of the countries they come from. 1 million, 87,000, are from the United Kingdom. 518,000 are from New Zealand. 509,000 are from China. 455,000 are from India. 232,000 are from the Philippines. And 219,000 are from Vietnam. And Diana, this figure is for you. 174,000 are from Italy. So this is kind of the environmental scan. I mean, as you know, there's a lot more to it than this, but these are just some, some numbers as we look at these. Now, I want to look at the whole question from two perspectives, two vantage points. One is that we are people of the book, the scriptures. And what do the scriptures tell us? That's the first piece of it. And then I want to look at the church. We're people of the church. So what's the church been saying about immigrants and refugees really down through our history? Uh, and it will also help us guide our thinking about the debate that goes on around immigration today. And I'll focus on that much later. But from these two vantage points, we approach the issue of immigration. And even more importantly, we approach our sisters and brothers who are immigrants themselves. So I want to look at the scriptural foundations first. As people of the book, so that's people of the Bible, so we share that with, with other Christians. We share that with Jews. We share that with Muslims to a certain extent, et cetera. And so, so, so there are common themes. I'm going to quote a section from evangelicals a little bit later about they, the way they read the scriptural history of people on the move. But before I get to that, there are three concepts from the scriptures that I want to use for us to sort of frame a scriptural referent for this whole thing. And one is the Anawim, uh, and I'll explain what that is in a moment. The second is the Jubilee which is a concept that comes from the book of Leviticus. And the third is the concept of pilgrim people, people on the move, which is a concept that the Second Vatican Council used a lot to talk about the church. Um, but first, let's talk about the Anawim. In the, Jewish, in the Jewish scriptures, there were three groups of people who comprised the Anawim. They were women and children and Basically, people we translate now sometimes as strangers or sojourners, but they were basically foreigners living in the land of Israel. Um, and as people of the book, as we think about this, we, we have, and think through the scriptures, it said the Jews were, were 
in their living memory of, of their own relationship to God. They had been immigrants, if you remember, into Egypt when Joseph was there, when there was starvation at home. And then they become refugees out of Egypt when Moses leads them out of Egypt later on. So they have that, both of those experiences in their lived memory. And as such, they have experienced both hardship and they have experienced the care of God for them uh, in both being supported by going into Egypt and then in getting out of Egypt later on from what had been kind of a, a, a slave status that they had had there. So they understand that immigrants and refugees are part of this protected group of people, a protected class who are known the way our bishops talk about it as God's poor. God says to the Hebrews through the prophet Jeremiah, so this is in Jeremiah chapter 5, chapter 7, only if you thoroughly reform your ways and your deeds if each of you deals justly with your neighbor, if you no longer oppress the alien and the orphan, only then will I, continue, will I let you continue to dwell in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors long ago and forever. And then even more so in, this, in the New Testament, we know that Joseph and Mary and Jesus become refugees fleeing from being murdered, etc., and become immigrants later on back into Israel. So there's, so there's that tradition as well within the New Testament. Um, so the poor play a critical part in the biblical view of the world and in its understanding of persons and property and community and the place of the immigrant or refugee. So from the time of the Deuteronomic laws, the covenant and the earliest prophets, there was a special mention of the poor and a special place within them for immigrants that, and, and for their place within the larger community. The Hebrew word is the Anawim. When I first encountered the word 30 or 40 years ago, the translation was the little ones. Then later digging into it, its second meaning is those who cry out to God for help. And that was these three groups of people. I used to tell Catholic Charity staffs around the country, if you think about it, what we did there, and I'm, I'm, it's, just, it's the same here in Australia, the basic group of people that were served by Catholic social service agencies are basically poor women poor children, and people who are literally not like us, meaning the majority. They are immigrants, they're refugees in your, in your country, First Nation people, they're people with a disability, people with HIV, AIDS. For some reason, people are seen as being not like us by the majority of people within a country. And so it's still the same group of people, and it's that way in every nation in the world. This is where poverty falls. On, uh, uh, these are the three groups that are really the poor and powerless within society. And they were the poor and the powerless within Hebrew society. And their existence, the very fact that that group existed, and the harsh conditions of their lives reflected Israel's violation of the social virtues that were rooted in the scriptures and in their ancient ideals. And poverty was often the result of unjust oppression. And so in this special status before God, before Yahweh, the Anuim embodied Israel's own history of enslavement in Egypt. Um, and like the Hebrews in Egypt, the poor had special protection from and special access to the Lord. The book of Exodus puts it this way. You shall not molest or oppress an alien, for you were once aliens yourselves in the land of Egypt. You shall not wrong any widow or orphan. If ever you wrong them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. It's in the book of Exodus, chapter 22. And this special status that they had within their society reflected a combination of powerlessness, poverty, and exclusion from full membership within the community and from the community's protection. So God becomes, at least our bishops write about it, God becomes their protector. And God's described as the protector and defender of the poor. And it was a twofold obligation of the people. One was to care for those who were poor, and the other one was to protect them from oppression. And I used to say to Catholic Charity staffs, that's still our mission today. We try to meet people's immediate needs, but we try to speak out, we as church, to speak out about the oppression of the poor within our societies. Um, and so as, as the scriptures developed, care for the Anuim actually became the test of Israel's faithfulness. Did it know its own God? Did it know Yahweh, who had this special love for the poor? And the poor become a measure of their fidelity to God. And so it's at the heart of the biblical concepts of justice and righteousness is the responsibility to this group of people. It also underpins the church's position today on the treatment of migrants and immigrants and refugees and the more detailed discussions we'll get to in a moment from Catholic social teaching 
modern, what we call modern Catholic social teaching, that we as church are called to care for those who are in need and to protect them from oppression. The second theme that I want to focus on, so as I said earlier, they're, they're called God's poor. The second theme is the Jubilee. This is a concept that I have been fascinated with for about 40 years now. Uh, it's in the book of Leviticus. Uh, in every 7th or 49th year. There was the great jubilee, supposed to be in every 49th or 50th year. We don't know, some of the, this is imprecise. When those who were indebted or enslaved, and enslaved often because of debt, were to be freed. They were to be restored back to full membership within the community. And in every 7th year, the sabbatical year, I sort of tell my college professor friends that, you know why you guys get a sabbatical every 7th year? It's because it's in the scriptures. <laughs> You know, even if they don't believe in God, that's why you're getting your sabbatical. But there was the, the lesser seventh year sabbatical year, and then there was the great jubilee in every 49th and 50th year. I'm going to quote a lot from, from uh, Pope St. John Paul II here because he used this theme a lot for the turning of the millennium for the year 2000, which was considered to be a great jubilee year. Um, and so Leviticus explains the responsibility from, from, uh, for the jubilee. The Lord said to Moses on Mount Sinai, speak to the Israelites and tell them, when you enter the land that I am giving you, so they're, they're just coming out of Egypt, he said, let the land too keep a Sabbath for the Lord. For six years you may sow your field, and for six years prune your vineyard, gathering in their produce. But during the seventh year the land shall have a complete rest, a Sabbath for the Lord, when you may neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. The 50th year you shall make sacred by proclaiming liberty in the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. And when every one of you shall return to his own property, everyone to his own family estate. So they were to be restored back to right order, restored back to full membership within the community. Then the text goes on to say, this is in the book of Leviticus, that property was never to be lost permanently, that people would become indebted and lost their property but were to be restored back to their property which they had lost for sale or forfeiture. And it was to be returned to them in the Jubilee year. And those who become indentured or enslaved because of their poverty were to be freed. So it writes, Leviticus continues. When there, then your countrymen become so impoverished beside you that he sells you his services, do not make him work as a slave. Rather, let him be like a hired servant or like your tenant, working with you until the Jubilee year, when he, together with his children, shall be released from your service and return to his kindred and to the property of his ancestors. And then, as I say, in the seventh year, in the, 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 the sabbatical year, there was supposed to be a lesser form of this. We don't know how well they lived up to this, but we do know that there's a lot of rabbinical writing, writing by the rabbis, about what is my responsibility in the seventh year to my community, and what is my responsibility in the 50th year. So we know they grappled with it without knowing how well they did at it. And as I say, the Jubilee year, the, the grand Jubilee, or the grand sabbatical was to be in every 49th or 50th year. People restored again back to the community. John Paul picks this up, Pope St. John Paul, when he explains in, in a letter he wrote in 1994 called Tercio Millennio Adveniente, the third millennium coming. It was in preparation for the millennium. He writes this, what was true for the sabbatical year was also true for the Jubilee year, which fell every 50 years. In the Jubilee year, however, the customs of the sabbatical year were broadened and celebrated with ever greater solemnity. One of the most significant consequences of the Jubilee year was the general emancipation of all dwellers on the land in need of being freed. And that took place, as I say, by restoring all the members to the community, no matter what their standing opposition had become, and to a full share of the community's goods and property was to be returned to its original owners. John Paul actually used this Jubilee theme to lead a worldwide uh, jubilee for nations in debt. It was parallel to what the individual debtor in Israel experienced when they were forgiven their debts. John Paul, along with the band Bono and U2, led, U2 led, led this international movement to, for debt relief of, of poor nations. Um, now, there were all sorts of rules attached to it, but what it meant was that nations which had become so indebted by whatever kind of spending, by whoever the government was, et cetera, were allowed to, instead of paying their debt payments, were allowed to use that money, they had to, and there were restrictions that they had to use the money they would have used for debt payments for education and health care and social services of their people. So it was, it was, it was hemmed in 
you know, in international agreements, et cetera, but it was the concept of the Jubilee actually carried into the 21st century. Um, so I like to think that immigration is a Jubilee concept. It's saying to people, you, you may be in our community illegally, or you may be from a foreign country, you may be enslaved here, you may be a worker here, et cetera, but we think we think you should be freed and allowed back in. For us as Catholics, it's a reconciliation concept about reconciling people to the community at large. The, f the third, so the sabbatical year, the jubilee year, the year of the Lord. Now this is, this is an interpretation by our bishops in the United States, which is that when Jesus says in Luke 4, remember he says he goes into the synagogue, he reads a text from Isaiah, about I've come to bring sight to the blind, freedom to the captive, and, and to announce a year of favor from the Lord. Our bishops are writing that this was actually a jubilee concept, that Jesus was coming to say, I've come to restore the community back to right relationships with one another, um, just as the jubilee would have done. And they even called Jesus jubilee, that Jesus was like jubilee in terms of, of his ministry. And one of his most significant, there's a wonderful book called uh, Food for the Journey by a sister, Immaculate Heart of Mary sister, uh, Juliana Casey, where she talks about why does Jesus heal it's a reconciliation concept, because remember, in his society, to be sick or disabled, you were considered to be possessed by a demon and excluded from the community, especially people with any kind of, they call it leprosy, but any kind of skin disease. What Jesus does is he heals those people. He touches them first, which makes him impure, impure in his community's sense. And he says to almost everyone, go home or go show yourselves to the rabbi to be declared clean so you can rejoin the community. So in Juliana's book, she argues that healing and the healing ministry that the church has carried on for 2,000 years is about restoring people to right order. We could say this in, in honor of both Grace and, and Deacon uh, Greg, that right now because they're sick, they're separated from the community. And that getting healed is to be restored back to the community. And that's what Jesus does all through his ministry. So this is, so this is, this is the Jubilee tradition and then Jesus as Jubilee. And, and as I say, I think immigration reform is a kind of jubilee concept. The third concept I want to focus on is the concept of basically people on the move. Um, wait, I lost my text here. Which is the pilgrim people concept that the, the, the bishops talk about from Vatican II, et cetera. But I'm just, I'm just, just to give you an example of it from other people of the book, there's a statement that I really like from the National Association of Evangelicals in the United States, where they write this, and they sum it all up just in this one paragraph. The Bible contains many accounts of God's people who were forced to migrate due to hunger, war, or personal circumstances. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the families of his sons turned to Egypt in search of food. Joseph, Naomi, Ruth, Daniel and his friends, Ezekiel, Ezra, Nehemiah and Esther all lived in foreign lands. In the New Testament, Joseph and Mary fled with Jesus to escape Herod's anger and became refugees in Egypt. Peter referred to the recipients of his first letters as aliens and strangers, perhaps suggesting that they were exiles within the Roman Empire. They go on, these examples from the Old and Doom Testament reveal God's hand in the movement of people and are illustrations of faith in God in difficult circumstances. And so the people of Israel, for all of these reasons, etc., are charged to remember that they themselves had been migrants in a foreign land and that their history should make them be careful about the well-being of other people on the move who might settle in their midst. I have to think in my own country and of my own parents. My mother is French, Irish, and Italian and my father is Scotch-Irish and German, uh, and they, they represent generations of immigrants to my country, and your country, much the same. The only people not immigrants in my country were those who were already there, and then those who were brought as slaves. Um, so, so we had this experience, and what the church is urging us to do is to think, and that's what the evangelicals are saying, is to think from that experience about ourselves. Now let me talk about modern Catholic social teaching and what our church says. Uh, and there are two fundamental themes in the catechism of the Catholic Church that ground all of Catholic social teaching. First is human dignity. 
Go back to the book of Genesis. We are, every one of us, created in the image and likeness of God. It is both sanctity and a source of human dignity. And the second is the common good. I'm going to talk a little bit about both of these in a moment. And the common good is a Greek concept, which I'll come back to and explain in a moment. Um, and these are the foundations. Our bishops will sometimes write that the human person is sacred, that's principle one, and social, that's principle two. That we're intimately related to others. We know, for example, when the fall of the wall in, in, in Eastern Europe, the communist wall, that there were babies in orphanages who were fed and cleaned and kept and, and in beds and not fondled. And that that failure to fondle, to hold, to, to, to caress, et cetera, resulted in psychological damage for, for, for many of them because we are essentially human beings. We know this. I, I laugh to myself over the years. I come home and find tissue paper in my pockets and empty them out after a trip or whatever, and then I stop and I go, my father used to do this. We know that we, we come from families and are shaped by those families and that we are essentially social human beings. And so the first principle, the human dignity principle, let me just move to my next page here. I want to just develop this a little bit. From, from human dignity comes the right to migration. Uh, it, it's part that the right to life and the conditions worthy of human life are rooted in human dignity. Um, and the right to migrate. Now this is from Pope John XXIII back in 1963. He writes, every human being has the right of freedom of movement and of residence within the confines of his own country. And when there are just reasons for it, the right to immigrate to other countries and take up residence there. So this, I'm sort of looking now at what we call modern Catholic social teaching, which really goes back to the beginning of the last, of the last century. And that, so this is 59 years ago he says this. And it's a double right, as you can tell within this quote. It's a right to immigrate out of my country and the right to immigrate into another country. Those are rooted in the church teaches human dignity and sanctity. The second principle, the common good, that's what I just said, right to immigrate and emigrate, and it's rooted in the right to life and the conditions worthy of human life. The second principle is the common good. The common good is a concept, you know, our church took the better things from all the cultures that we've been present in over the years, many things. And one of the things we took was the concept of the common good from Greek and Latin philosophy and thought. And the common good was a principle of the Greek city-states, those early forms of democracy, and it had three elements to it. And, it. and this is all, by the way, in the Catholic Catechism. You can just go to common good and you'll find these three elements there. The first is respect for the individual and for human rights. And the duty of the common good, and we'll get to whose, whose duty is this, but it, it was a value that everyone, a citizen, was responsible for. And I'll get to the government's responsibility for this in a moment. But the first part was respect for the individual rights of people. The second is as you would expect, is the social well-being and development of the group, which means balancing these rights that all, everybody has, um, et cetera, and, and trying to create well-being among the basically what we call the common good. By the way, there were common good phrases in our Constitution, um, et cetera. And the third principle is peace, which results, the third element of the common good, which results from the stability of a just society. So for example, right now in Ukraine or in Syria, you can't really promote the common good. You can promote some of it because of the war that's going on, civil war going on within those societies. Um, and so as I say, the common good is defined, was then picked up by, uh, actually by, by John XXIII in Mater Magistra, which was one of his encyclicals, and by Vatican II. So Vatican II defined it as the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. Pope Benedict, writing about the common good, says it's the good of, quote, all of us, made up of individuals, families, and intermediate groups who constitute society. It is the good that is sought not for its own sake, but for the people who belong to the social community and who can only really and effectively pursue their good within it. If you don't have these elements, it's very hard for the individual to pursue their own individual good within society. Um, and the common good applies to every human community, but its most concrete embodiment is supposed to be in the political community, that it is the highest duty of government to promote the common good and of citizens. And that goes back to the Greek city-states. It was the duty of those who were elected to leadership within those cities. 
And the catechism notes these three elements, respect for the individual, social well-being and development of the group, and peace, which results from the stability of a just society. The common goods conception, as I said, lies in Greek and, and Roman uh, political life and philosophy and the good of the city. Let's look at the first thing for a minute, individual respect. The catechism says, quote, public authorities are bound to respect the fundamental and inalienable rights of the human person, close quote. This means far more than just the utilitarian greatest good of the greatest number, but insists that majorities respect minorities and the rights of minorities. So it's not just a majority vote about what's, what's good and what's not. The second element, the group's social well-being and development maintains that the authority's proper functioning is to arbitrate between various particular interests in society. But essential to this is ensuring the accessibility of each person, this is in the catechism, to what is needed to lead a truly human life. Food, clothing, health, work, education and culture, suitable information, and the right to establish a family, and so on. The third element, which is this peace and stability thing, presupposes, again from the catechism, that authority should ensure by morally acceptable means the security of its society and its members. Then the catechism goes on to say, well, whose responsibility is this? First, it's, it's the responsibility of each individual within society. Second, it's the state or the government since, and this is from Pope Benedict in 2009, the common good is the reason that political authority exists. You're getting ready for an election in about another week. That's actually the purpose that everybody running for office. I remember once in a U.S. election, one of my, my nephews by marriage saying, well, you know, I'm voting for so-and-so because it's good for our business. You know, this was Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner, so I wasn't going to say, by the way, that's not the Catholic position. <laughs> The Catholic position is what's good for the common good of society, not for your business or anybody else's business. It's for the whole well-being of society at large. Um, and so it's everyone has this responsibility. Pope Benedict writes, the more we strive to secure a common good corresponding to the real needs of our neighbors, the more effectively we love them. Every Christian is called to practice this charity in a manner corresponding to his vocation and according to the degree of influence that he wields in the polis. Polis was the Greek word for city. That's where we get the word political. It comes from, it comes from the Greek word polis. And, and in that letter, Benedict says that this is what he called the institutional path of charity, that love. It's, it's in a letter he wrote called God is Love. It was his first encyclical when he was, when he was elected pope. And it's what he called the institutional path of charity, which means addressing juridical, civil, political, and cultural institutions. And when animated by this love, he said, this path is great, it has greater worth than a merely secular or political stand in society. The state, though, also has this responsibility because the common good, as I indicated, is the reason political authority exists. So the state has to ensure coherency and unity and organization of the civil society, in Benedict's language, in order that the common good may be attained with the contribution of every citizen. In discussing immigration, it's important to realize that responsibility for the common good is not just for my country. Popes write about there is a universal common good, which now, especially with globalization, extends to the whole world. And according to Pope Benedict, this common good and the effort to achieve it must assume, quote, the dimensions of the whole human family. That is to say, the community of peoples and nations in such a way as to shape the earthly city in unity and peace rendering it to some degree an anticipation and prefiguration of the undivided city of God. So these are the two fundamental principles of Catholic social teaching. There's lots of other principles that, that derive really from these two. Um, and let me talk more particularly now about immigration reform in light of these. In 2015, it's, I said it's earlier, the common good is universal. In 2015, yeah, before I get to these principles, the, the bishops of Australia wrote the following. For years, Australian society has been divided by the debate over asylum seekers who arrive by boat. In the words of our national anthem, they have come across the seas. But both sides of politics have exaggerated the challenge they present to this country. Australia's response has been to devise ever harsher policies that aim to deter those fleeing war 
and violence and to incarcerate people who are in fact victims. It has worsened over time. Today the panic and mistrust that is stirred up by this debate are out of all proportion to the true scale of the issue in Australia. The globalization of indifference, which Pope Francis refers to, has emerged in Australia. It is an indifference to the reasons behind people's fight from persecution, to the human dignity of every person, and to our once proud tradition of protecting and supporting victims of war and violence. This is a volatile issue in my country as well. And so I want to now look at five principles to help us think about immigration. These come from a letter written by the bishops of the United States with the bishops of Mexico. Because, you know, there's an enormous border there and an enormous question about immigrants and refugees on our borders. And the bishops, working out of the tradition of Catholic social thought, enunciate five principles about migration. And we sort of touched on them already, but I think it helps to put Catholic social teaching, which can be very complex, in, in fairly simple categories, although there's a very complex issue right in the middle of them. We'll get to it. The first is people have a right to find opportunities in their own homeland. So dictators or governments that are not making it possible for people to work and make a living for themselves, et cetera, they're violating people's rights to find opportunities within their own country. And that's the first right. And, and if you actually talk to people who really are driven from their countries, most of them didn't want to leave. They want to be at home with people they know, with their relatives, with the language they speak, with the food they like, et cetera. And so they, they want to be in their own country and to stay in their own country, most people, especially those who are driven out by violence and war. So the first principle is that people have a right to find opportunities within their own homeland. And that principle goes back, actually, in modern Catholic social teaching to 1891, to the first encyclical uh, the, of what we call modern Catholic social teaching called Rerum Novarum from Pope Leo XIII when he talks about this right uh, to find work and opportunity within your own country. The second principle is that people have a right to migrate to support oneself and one's family. That goes back to what, what uh, uh, John XXIII said about, no, actually it was Pius XII said about the right to emigrate out and emigrate into another country. People have that right when they can't find when they can't make a living for themselves. And so in 1952, when Pius XII defined this, he said, both natural law, which, which the church worked out of, and devotion to humanity required that international migration be open to people forced from their own countries by revolutions, unemployment, or hunger. He's, now, he's writing in 1952, so that's the era right after World War II, when so many people were displaced around the world by the violence. And he explains why. He says, for the creator of the universe made all good things primarily for the good of all. And so when people can't find work, they have a right to move to find work. Now here's where we're going to get into the area of complexity. That's one right that I have. But nations have a right to control their borders. And that, that right goes back to the common good again, because they have a duty to the common good of their people. They have a right to control their borders if that's a threat to the common good of their own people. But it's a limited right. And I want to give you a couple of ways of thinking about it and a couple of ways that church leaders have thought about this. In the letter from the U.S. and Mexican bishops, they put it this way. While the sovereign state may impose reasonable limits on immigration, the common good is not served when the basic human rights of the individual are violated. In the current condition of the world in which global poverty and persecution are rampant, the presumption is that people must migrate in order to support and protect themselves and that nations who are able to receive them should do so whenever possible. What might those limits be? One of them is what, I, what we just said. If you've got the ability to receive people, you have a duty to do so. And then in 52, Pope Pius XII wrote, the sovereignty of the state cannot be exaggerated to the point that access to this land is, for inadequate or unjustified reasons, denied to the needy and decent people from other nations. Um, and then our bishops writing in the year 2000, reflecting on this tension between these two rights, um, they write that the end of rights of the individual give rise to, quote, a more compelling claim to the conditions worthy of human life. And earlier in a 1959 statement on migration, our bishops wrote that it is necessary for nations to make laws to ensure that the use of resources are, are 
in a reasonable and orderly fashion, but the tenor of the law should be such as to facilitate, not impede access to them. That's a quote I just read. And then this is, again from the bishops, give rise to a more compelling claim to the conditions worthy of human life. And again, necessary for nations to make laws to ensure the use of these resources in a reasonable and orderly fashion. But the tenor of the law should be such as to facilitate, not impede access to them. And then this is the Australian bishops in 2015. Australia, like every other nation, has the right to regulate migration flows and assess the status of people seeking protections within its borders through a rigorous processing system. However, this is the limitation language, a system that restricts both the individual's right to seek asylum and the state's obligation to provide protection is inherently flawed. And so, and so the bishops have really taken this up and the Vatican and the Pope as well. But, there, but there's a tension between these two, so you get into fact questions. Can the nation accept more people? And are people's rights to move and to seek a new home and to protect their family, are they being respected as well? Uh, is there an alternative that you should be promoting, et cetera? But people have a right, and we'll get to some more details of this in a minute. So go back again. These are the first three rights, right to find opportunities in one's homeland, right to migrate, nation's right to control borders. Now the fourth right, this is a slightly different population. This is not just somebody who's hungry, but somebody who's fleeing war and violence and danger to themselves. They're a refugee and asylum seeker. They have a higher right to move, and they are deserving of greater protection by governments, et cetera. Um, so the bishops here wrote, for example, within this context, I mean, one of the things that the U.S. and Mexican bishops wrote is this requires at a minimum that migrants have a right to claim their refugee status without incarceration and to have their claims fully considered. And the bishops of Australia wrote in 2015, about 90% of the boat arrivals who've been processed in the past have been found by our rigorous refugee status determination process to be genuine refugees in need of protection. So factually, 90% of the people met the standard of what it means to be a refugee and asylum seeker. This alone should tell us, the bishops wrote, that, quote, turning back the boats is harming genuine refugees. They went on to write, Australia has an obligation to protect people who are found to be refugees and to those who are asylum seekers. As a global citizen, Australia has the opportunity to lead a regional response that respects the right of each nation to protect its borders while ensuring protection for asylum seekers and the establishment of prompt refugee status. And the fifth principle is that once you're in a country, even if you're undocumented, you still have your human dignity and your human rights, and you need to be treated with dignity and rights. There's a whole other area that comes up in my country, et cetera, which is about whether these people are abused in terms of work relationships. And so we found, for example, in New Orleans, we had a lot of undocumented people who came in to help us rebuild that some people were hiring them off the street corners, and we have, this is all documented, employing them for a week, and then at the end of the week, calling immigration to come pick them up so that the employer didn't have to pay them, which is exploiting the immigrant worker. And it takes place in the world in a lot of different ways. And so work is, is, is uh, at the heart of the whole social question, so much so that in John Paul's writing, Pope St. John Paul, he talks about work as being the center of the social question. Why? First, because you need to work to be able to support yourself and your family. Second, because work and the income you receive for work allows you to contribute to the common good of your society. But the third is, and this is in, John Paul wrote a letter in, in 1981 on human work, and he said, by our work, we may not think about this in our jobs, we are, we are like God in that we are continuing the creative activity in the world, God's creative activity. We are co-creators with God, and when we cannot work, it is an assault on human dignity. So you've seen the articles when people who are unemployed for a long period of time often suffer from depression and other kinds of problems because it's an assault on their human dignity not to be able to take care of themselves and their families. Um, and so coming out of all of this, the Australian bishops then lay out the following steps that should be taken in Australia. And we'll just do a summary of these. They write, this is all quotation from them. We call on our political leadership to ensure public debate is characterized by respect for human dignity and of people seeking asylum. Second, Australia should be processing asylum seekers' claims onshore 
Detention in immigration facilities should be for the shortest period possible to undertake identity, health, and security check. No child should be detained solely on the basis of their immigration status, and all children are entitled to a healthy family life with the support and nurture of their parents. We had a scandal of what we were doing to families and children on our border, on our southern border. Thirdly, Australia should be showing leadership in the region, not just in combating pe people smuggling, but in increasing the capacity for protection and resettlement places within Southeast Asia, not just here. Globally, we should be making concrete efforts to engage with source countries to provide in-country support to people who are displaced. That's that first principle, that governments should be able to provide for their own people. I didn't add that other governments should help them to do that so that people don't have to move. Bishops go on. There's a, there should be a substantial increase in Australia's humanitarian intake with flexibility to increase this number in case of major global crises like Ukraine. In fact, when I, when I was in dialogue with, with uh, Deacon Lowe, Deacon Greg, he, he didn't call me back at one point. He came back and apologized. He said, we just got our first Ukrainian family uh, here. Uh, and then next paragraph, that people living in the community while their asylum claims are being processed should be afforded worker rights. Then they go on to say, we must ensure that no one seeking Australia's protection, regardless of whether they are in onshore or offshore facilities or in a third country under a bilateral resettlement agreement, is ever deported to danger. And then they went on to say, these suggestions are not new or extraordinary. Such policy approaches have been suggested and implemented before. So how do we respond? Pope St. John Paul II will talk about solidarity. As, and he talks about it, and you know, that the big union in Poland before the fall of communism was called Solidarity. He actually writes about Solidarity, and I remember memorizing in Catholic school as a boy the virtues and lists of virtues, and so Solidarity was never on the list. But John Paul talks about Solidarity as a moral virtue. It's a very important quotation from him about how we should respond to people, and he writes this. Let me just give you some bullets on this, I'm doing this. Solidarity, therefore, must play its part in the realization of the divine plan, both on the level of individuals and on the level of national and international society. The evil mechanisms and structures of sin, he'd been talking about injustice in the world and political and social injustice, they can only be overcome through the exercise of the human and Christian solidarity to which the church calls us and which she tirelessly promotes. What is this solidarity? He says this, and as I say, it was not on my list of virtues when I was in school. Solidarity then, he said, is not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of so many people both near and far. But on the contrary, it's a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. That is to say, to the good of all and of each, each individual because we really are all responsible for all. So what might this solidarity look like for us? Five quick things. Seeing other people as us. I mean, one of the worst things in what, the way a lot of social evil takes place is we see other people as them, and they're not like us. But to see other people as us. Secondly, to try to understand what are called the push-pull factors, that people at our border are there, one, because their own, often, because their own country did not provide for them the opportunity to make a living and to support their families. And two, they're being attracted by our need for, for labor. As, as one speaker said once before, we have a sign at the border that says no entry, and about 100 yards behind it is another sign that says help wanted. So we're sending different signals within our own, within our own country, et cetera. And so to understand what are the push factors that push people out of their own country, and what are the pull factors that pull people to certain other countries. Third, try, try to learn what the church is teaching about this and repeatedly saying to us about immigration. Fourth, try to make our parish communities welcoming to people who are different, which requires some changes sometimes in the culture of parishes. And we did a study from the Institute over about a three-year uh, period with other Christian denominations about three questions. How do, we make, how do we change the public debate about immigration? How do we make our parishes more welcoming? And how do we help our parishes to become advocates for immigrant justice? And so we want our parishes to be more welcoming. And then being a voice for justice within our country. There's an expert on immigration policy in the United States that says, our church does not have an immigration policy. He says, we have a person policy to treat all people as persons. And that that dignity doesn't change when people cross a border, even if they do so illegally. A um, couple of final thoughts. First, in the public debate, we are not doing it for our own good. 
Some people in the United States will say, well, you're doing it to get more Latinos in your churches. Well, we're not doing it for that reason. We're doing it because it's, it's our duty to the common good. Secondly, we come to this issue as, as, a matter, as people of faith. So it's not a question of talking heads on TV, debating, debating. It's about what, what does our faith tradition say about people who are on the move, and what does it say about our responsibility to them. And third, sometimes people will say to us, you're working on a losing cause, et cetera. And at that point, I want to say to them uh, and share with you the wonderful thing. We have to be, and we say, we talk about faith, hope, and charity. And I think hope is the one we don't pay much attention to. Uh, and I say to people, the best stories about hope are the parables Jesus tells about planting seeds from which forests grow. But the best, if you want to call it secular, the best secular commentary about hope is from the poet, the Czechoslovakian poet Václav Havel, who came to the United States in 1986 during the era of communism in his country. And he gave a talk at Liberty Hall in Philadelphia. And near the end of that talk, he talked about hope. And I want to share his talk with you because it's his, his thing. And I have it on a, uh, this is the things I just said about our points. I have it on this thing, but I'll give it to you where you can read it a little bit clearer. He said this. He said, either we have hope within us or we don't. It is a dimension of the soul. And it's not essentially dependent on some particular observation of the world or estimate of the situation. Hope is not prognostication. It is an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy that things are going well or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for early success, but rather an ability to work for something because it is good, not just because it stands a chance to succeed. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. It is this hope, above all, which gives us the strength to live and continually try new things, even in conditions that seem as hopeless as ours do here and now. And when he says this in 1986, his country is living under communism, which he had been an outspoken opponent of. And three years later, everything he'd worked for and hoped for happened. The communist government collapsed. He went on to become president of the Czech Republic. But it's the best thing about hope, because especially this last sentence, even in conditions that seem as hopeless as ours do here and now. So when we deal with complex, difficult problems like immigration or poverty or whatever it may be, we have to be people of hope who do what is right, not just because it stands a chance to succeed, but because it's right and because it's good. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Did anyone have any questions? Yes. Where does the issue of human trafficking comes into all this? Well, obviously, it comes in as, as exploitation of people who are poor. So you go back to that principle about care and resisting oppression. I mean, obviously, part of it's a form of exploitation of poor and not respecting the dignity of these people, et cetera. The other question is, is human tra trafficking prospering because we're not letting people in? Well, here it is often used as the Russian Nile for what you mentioned was this globalization of indifference, yeah. that if we are welcoming to um, immigrants that come across the sea, we will be fostering the human trafficking business. So then the question becomes, can you, can you do, can you make arrangements to try to give people a way to, to make access to your country back in their home countries? And that's the question for us as a country. Are we doing anything in El Salvador and Honduras, et cetera, in Central America that makes it possible for people to come to our country without mm. a lot of them do this thing of riding on the side of, top of these trains and people are you know, yeah. crushed on the border, you know, on the way to the border, et cetera, et cetera. And so you know, is, is, is there a way for us to do what was called orderly departure, which we did in other countries uh, when there was oppression, et cetera, or an oppressive government, we, we tried to arrange systems of orderly departure to allow people to leave their own country and to go to other countries, our own and, and others. So you've got to see it within those larger forces as well. But obviously, those people are taking, the, 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 the traffickers are taking advantage of the, the larger situation. Because they're often called um, as queue jumpers, you know, the people that use human traffickers. But uh, then, of course, the question is, where is the queue? 
you know, the queue is so long and so slow and so desperate that people um, take desperate means. Well, I think so that's why your bishop said Australia be, should be considering a larger influx of people. And our countries, we can afford it. In fact, that's the thing I said about the two signs. Our business people and our farmers, they want more immigration because they want the labor. Now then you have to deal with, are they paying the laborers yes. fair, fair wages? Yes. You know, those questions become part of your larger responsibility to human beings. Yeah. Yes? Just making a comment, um, because this touches me quite deeply. Migrants, refugees, it, it touches me very deeply. But uh, the more I think about it and the more I observe and read, I come to think that it's more than just providing a physical safe space for people. I think that um, we need to think in a broader way, provide an infrastructure to help the migrants adjust, settle, adapt. Why? Because we are seeing a very great number of um, migrant youth in our jails. So they're being more and more associated with criminal behavior. So it's not just providing uh, an open door, but something needs to happen yeah. to... Francis, talk, both Francis talks about four things. I'm not going to remember all four, but it's like hospitality, accompanying, etc. And, and a lot of them, the other way that we, the certain yeah. United States work was, and one way parishes work, was they provided sponsoring families. You know, because if you're, I mean, if you've been in other countries where people speak different languages, it's really hard. And so often we had sponsor families mm. in family, in parishes, who would mm. take family to family and help people understand our money, the complexity. Mm. Like, I haven't figured out your coins yet, and I've been here for seven weeks. Why are the bigger ones worth less than the smaller ones? You know, but... But, but families provided that assistance to other families and helped them adjust, helped them find out yes. how to go shopping yes. and other kinds of things. And it was very important, especially in the early months, of helping people go into in countries. And so it's much more, as you're saying, it's more, much more than just giving people an apartment somewhere. Much more. Thank you. OK, um, thank you so much, you're Father welcome. Fred. Uh, please join with me in uh, thanking Father Fred Kammer for his wonderful talk this afternoon. And I personally love the fact that you've ended with us focusing on hope, because hopefully that's, that's where we will all be, you know, in terms of our actions, and that will move from our head to our heart space. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And also, you are welcome to join us. Um, there's actually going to be some refreshments in a room. It's actually just a little room down the stairs as we walk along this uh, walkway. Then there's just some stairs if we go down there. There's a nice area where you can get a, a cuppa or an orange juice or something to eat. And you. you may even be able to have a little bit more of a chat with Father Fred. Right. <laughs> and put it here in the deep No, end. that's fine. But thank you for your attendance and please join us. Um, I'll, I'll show you exactly where to go. Thank you so much. That you're welcome. Really oh, you're welcome.